maybe a couple hundred. So thanks for joining us. Our first UC San Diego Chart of Accounts Q&A session. Um, I'll go around the room and each of our panelists will introduce themselves. But just for ground rules here, if you could um, post your questions in the Q&A um, section of Zoom rather than the chat, that would help us out. And also, if you could limit your questions to the chart of account uh, questions, that would help us too. The functionality in Oracle is something we're currently working on and with. So I think we'd be better prepared to answer any questions you have around chart of accounts and how the chart of accounts was designed and worked and works. So with that, I am Bill McCarroll. I'm director of accounting for the campus and I'm the uh, design lead for uh, the business area. I'm Jamie Nichol, Associate Director of General Accounting, and I have been working on the chart of accounts for the last year and a half. My name is Laura Blankenship, and I'm the uh, change practitioner on this project. Um, my name is Charles Way. I'm the VC Health Services Accounting Department. I'm Adam DeFranco. I'm the Director of Budget Finance for Academic Affairs, and I'm one of the change leads on the project. Marissa Pro, and I am Associate Director in the Office of Postwork Financial Services. And for this project, I am the Project Portfolio Management Design Lead, which is one of the modules in Oracle. My name is Kirsten Sykes. I'm the Foundation Controller, and I'm the Foundation Design Lead for the project. Um, William Burnett, I'm the Accounting Manager for the Positions Group and PHSO. I'm Diane Heath, and I've been helping with the Chart of Accounts documentation and mapping. And I'm Rush Mabir. I work in the Campus Budget Office, and I am the Department Hierarchy Subject Matter Expert. All right. So um, we'll get started. Uh, first chart here, just to give you some background on where we've been with the Chart of Accounts. It has been actually a work in progress since around 2012. Uh, UCLP initiated a steering group made up of campus controllers who recognized the need for a system-wide chart of accounts that would be able to aggregate data from all the campuses in a common way so that the definitions and uh, roll-up consolidation to UCOP had uh, stronger meaning. So even though we've only been working on this camp at the campus for about a year, maybe a year and a half, um, it has been ongoing since uh, 2012. So the reason why we needed a common chart of accounts, um, the current UCOP chart is outdated. It's overly complex. It doesn't meet the reporting needs of UCOP to the state or to the auditors. Um, the consolidations from each of the campuses are mapped consolidations that have different meanings. If you drill down into the campuses, they're all interpreting what uh, UCOP needs. The common chart attempts to bring that all together and uh, standardize the higher level uh, pieces of the chart. So really that's why it started off. Um, the next chart, the guiding principles, and these are the chart of account guiding principles for UCOP. These are not our chart, uh, principles, although we did abide by them. But as they were designing the top levels of the chart, they were looking for the chart of accounts to accommodate growth, to meet ongoing changing business requirements across the system. Um, it, was, it is going to require new and innovative ways of doing business, and we've seen that uh, just in the local design as well. Uh, it needs to meet the needs of stakeholders um, for campuses and medical centers and the foundation. It should be fairly simple, intuitive, and easy to comprehend. Um, hopefully that'll be the case. You'll see that today. Uh, each segment should have a clear and consistent definition. And we'll, we'll be drafting guidelines, communications, and documentation to support the chart design itself. And it should be based on, based on best practices. So it hopes to capture transactional data that when combined with the COA segments and attributes from subsidiary systems, it supports everything we do across the campus, including everything we do at the medical center, uh, support, supports OSHPOD requirements, um, which supports foundation requirements. Um, we didn't design the chart of accounts to be uh, specific to any financial application. This was back in 2012, so we wanted it to be agnostic and uh, fit any uh, future application we chose. 
uh, just happens that we did choose Oracle. And it should focus on long-term needs. It should be able to adapt to changing business requirements. And we were going to adopt um, the common chart of accounts across all the campuses when each campus was ready uh, to uh, take it on. So the goal, the next chart, the goal was to, uh, the, the common chart of accounts at the UCOP level was really down to a summary level, a level three. Um, they didn't dictate the details of the chart for each campus, but they did define the uh, summary elements that we would have to map up to. Um, our approach here was to take the common chart and extend it to our requirements for business here uh, across UCSD. Um, it had to meet all our, all our units' financial needs. It had to meet management reporting needs. It had to fit the diverse kind of business organizations we have and uh, all the activities that go on here. And I can say unequivocally that over the past year and a half, a lot of hard work has been put in by the Chart of Accounts team. Uh, I think we had representation with about 140 people. And uh, we, just, we just finalized that chart uh, this month. So I can claim project success. <laughs> well, we can claim project success. <laughs> so that's what we're going to talk to you about. Uh, Jamie's going to take it from here and kind of take you into the details of what the chart looks like and, and how it should work. Thank you. So this slide, some of you may have seen, especially if you were on the common chart of account work group, but it shows the mapping of the current IFAS chart of accounts to the new common UC common chart of accounts. And we're actually pretty lucky in that there's just a lot of simple straight lines. Um, some of the other campuses are going to have some issues mapping their, their charts to this new one. But ours, even though there were lots and lots of elements to map, I think 125,000 in total, uh, it's, it's in some cases more of a one-to-one. -one. So uh, location, we're known as the number six campus, UCLA is number four. Um, that, that will now be tracked in an entity chart element. Fund is still a fund, although there will be fewer of them. And we should work towards having the fund, um, a separate fund track a restriction or an internal designation, not necessarily needing to track each revenue stream, which I think we have a lot of funds that are just tracking a particular revenue stream. Organization is turning into financial unit, which we love to abbreviate, um, makes us all laugh. Um, Reshma was taking the lead on uh, working with the VC areas to kind of cleanse our current organizations. There were a number that didn't really represent a department. Um, we, we want them and need them to represent a department and have a, a reasonable hierarchy that fits with the org structure of each area. Um, account is still account. Uh, program in IFAS designates the Nakubo higher ed purpose of an, an expense, and that will be a function in Oracle, though I think we'll need to abbreviate it, because that's one of the words we can't use in Oracle for some reason. Um, in the new chart, there will be a program element, but that is meant for UC system-wide um, monies that UCOP will give us the money and tell us we need to use a certain program code to track it. Indexes as a shortcut feature um, in Oracle, a tiny bit about the functionality. It doesn't quite seem like there's a shortcut feature in Oracle, but I'm sure there will be some way um, that will help people uh, remember all the codes they need to put in. Um, index as a tracking element will likely turn into either something tracked in the project subledger or something tracked in a location chart element. Um, if neither of those works, the, the project subledger is meant to track expenses and revenues directly related to those expenses. So some things like balance sheet tracking would not work in the project subledger. So we would need to use an activity code for those. Um, some examples are the merchant credit card clearing cash accounts and internal loan 
uh, tracking. So PPM, just while I'm on this slide, um, for sure we have to track contracts and grants in the project subledger. That's a requirement of UCOP. Uh, we will pass information to them um, under the project number capital projects. We also have to track in PPM and based on some functionality we've recently learned about Oracle, it looks like a lot of department detail might be able to go into PPM with some templates and parameters. So that's kind of exciting and Marissa's thrilled. <laughs> okay, moving on to the next slide. So there's a lot of information on this slide, some of which I already covered. It's all the new chart. Up at the, at the top in the kind of the light blue, it indicates which chart elements have a, an overall structure uh, dictated by UCOP. So the entity, fund, account, function, and program. Um, they did not try to dictate a financial unit structure to us, knowing that each UC is organized slightly differently. And we thought initially that would make that one easy, but not given parameters, it, it made it a little more challenging, maybe. Um, so towards the bottom, well, I guess in the gray part, there's examples of what might go into each area. I think some of them are, are pretty self-explanatory. The entity, and I'll, I'll go through each one of these in a little bit. So the, the highest level entities for the campus are going to be UCSD, and then that's broken down into a campus, a medical center, and foundation. Um, let's see what else. Uh, project. I mentioned capital, um, capital projects and con contracts and grants will be in the project module. We are planning on having the project number reflect in the general ledger as a chart element. That's something optional with Oracle, but it was recommended to us that we do that, and we think it will be helpful in tracking cases where an area has budget to spend or money to spend. They spend part of it through the project module and part of it directly in the ledger. Being able to see that project number should be helpful in knowing what they've allocated there. Um, so at the bottom, you can see the, the field length the plan field link for these. Uh, sometimes it's dictated by UCOP. Um, fund uh, needs to be five due to a UC path uh, field limitation. Uh, we've tried to make it as short as possible, but it's still a, a total string length of 50. Uh, indexes are going away. Um, so, and I, I mentioned there's doesn't seem like there's a real shortcut feature in Oracle. So the good news is people will get really familiar with the chart of accounts and the coding and, and what it means. Um, the other information on this slide is the current number of UCSD codes. Uh, you could see we have quite a reduction in the number of funds. That's mostly related to contracts and grants. Also, a, a good reduction in financial unit. I think a lot of that is actually because we were using org or are using org to track each unique capital project and that will now be in the project module and also just because areas have been cleaning up realizing where they have a, an org number they're not even using and activating it or an org number that doesn't really represent a department and they're merging it. Um, also a a big reduction in the number of uh, program, IFAS program codes to Oracle function codes. There will be a much simpler functional uh, hierarchy. I'll get into that in a minute. So if you look to the far right, total number of codes, right now we have about 85,000 if you include an index as a code, and it's looking like there would be um, possibly 32,000 in Oracle. Within the project module, you can break a project into task. A task, we're not really considering that to be a, a code, but there is the possibility of breaking it down. All right. This um, chart is maybe a simpler view of the one before. It, it shows the entity and then the definition of that entity and the length. So nine segments, total of 50. At one point it was 70 something, so we've 
we've reduced it quite a bit. Okay, um, this shows the entity structure. So as I mentioned, UC San Diego is at the top and the major entities are campus medical center. Sometimes UCOP gives us money to spend on their behalf. So we need to identify that and then foundation. This slide shows the entity structure. Uh, so the same information I mentioned in the previous slide in at the level B, UCOP is dictating levels A, B, and C. We have chosen to break down the campus into its uh, various B, C levels, highest um, financial unit level. And that should allow some semblance of a balance sheet um, creation at that level. I'll just say here, the, the Sanford Consortium, people may wonder why that's there. Um, it's a blended component under accounting standards, so we have to include it. But um, it's not part of UCSD proper. Okay. Fund structure, I mentioned the, the fund is going to be limited to five digits. Uh, gift and endowment funds are going to start with a letter that will indicate the level of restriction, kind of the type of gift or endowment it is, the level of restriction. And do you want to mention this, the second one since it's kind of your? Sure. And foundation and campus will have a shared value. So when you call uh, foundation or gift processing and have questions, you won't have to use a translator or a secret decoder ring to figure out <laughs> what fund we're talking about. We'll all be speaking the same language. Good one. Maybe that was, this would be a good time to mention the same financial unit too. And foundation will also be sharing the same financial unit as campus. Yeah, easy, thank you. Uh, contract and grant awards will now be tracked in the project module and not in a unique fund. So we are just going to start out with three contract and grant funds, uh, federal, state and local and private. And then the detail will be in the project subledger. So that allowed a reduction in funds. There, there were or are 7,300 contract and grant funds going down to just three. We also identified where we could make some changes related to recharges. Currently, each recharge facility is assigned four different funds. Um, so there were about 750 funds. We realized it would be better if they were identified by their own unique financial unit code. And that way they could share funds and it would be a lot easier to identify all the recharge activity. And I think it actually makes for easier workflow routing in Oracle because I think that's based on financial unit. So we were able to reduce um, those funds and then some other minor reductions below. In, in some cases, I think we're going to need to look to consolidate more once we're on Oracle. We were a little concerned about too many moving pieces, or at least I was, in going from IFAS to Oracle. Um, didn't want to consolidate too much and, and cause reconciliation problems. But like I mentioned, it seems like we have a lot of funds that are just tracking a unique revenue stream. And ideally, it would just track what kind of restriction or internal designation there is on that money. This is just showing the high level fund hierarchy and the numbering. Uh, in a couple cases, uh, UCOP wanted to continue to use the special 19 and the 18 funds. And so they dictated, I guess everybody has those numbers memorized up at UCOP and they didn't want to change them. Um, so it causes a little bit of odd looking hierarchy. But in other cases, we were actually able to um, create the numbering. UCOP let us take the lead on creating the numbering that would work for us. So uh, now we, we have developed the numbering for the whole UC system, which is kind of fun. Our, our nerdy legacy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, financial unit, Reshma worked very hard on this. Um, Diane also played a large role. Let's see, is there anything special you want to mention with this, Reshma? The goal is to keep it simple, um, easy to identify the organization that's driving the business activity. 
and hopefully not a dramatic change. Everything should seem intuitive, and that's why they're working directly with the VC officers to make sure that um, there shouldn't be a shock when you go into Oracle. Good, thank you. I also kind of want to give credit to William for the position group, because I think they did something neat mm -hmm. where they had, I'll simplify it a little, so. <laughs> Let's say they had a unique board for their departments uh, a unique org for each location that that clinic operated out of. They realized that it would be better since we have the location chart element to just have one financial unit code for the department and use the location field to indicate the different areas. Um, so that will allow them to see the activity for the location by itself, all the different departments that operate out of that location, plus be able to see that department uh, regardless of its location. So. Creative thinking, William, good job. Uh, financial unit hierarchy, just um, we needed to start with the numbering with somewhere, so this will last until reorgs start to happen. But this is the, the starting first two digits for the numbering for each VC area. So trying to give room for the areas that are the biggest. Uh, all there really is to say on that. All right. We have a ton of questions yet. Right on. You've addressed all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're waiting till the end. I doubt that. <laughs> Just so everyone knows, the questions are anonymous. So if you're worried about everyone seeing your question, you can submit it, and we won't. No we won't watch to the question. Want tiny names to it. Okay. Except um, ours. Except ours. Account structure. So. Um, just know that every single chart of account element number is going to change. So you're, you're just going to have to learn new numbers. Um, sorry. Um, but assets will still start with one. Liabilities will start with two. There will be one beginning fund balance account, sometimes called net position, sometimes called equity. We'll start with three. Uh, one of the big changes, uh, UCOP is serious about this. Um, they want um, external revenues and external expenses separated from all the internal transactions. So external revenue will start with four, external expense will start with five, and then all the internal stuff will start with seven. And when all those sevens are consolidated, um, some of them need to net to zero here before our ledger file goes to UCOP. Some of it, if we're transacting with another um, UC, will need to consolidate to zero up at UCOP. So that, those seven accounts, um, the different types are shown on the right. So some of them are contract and grant um, subcontract transfers between locations. They will actually map now to the revenue hierarchy, which I think might help with deficit reporting. I think those transfers, the way they're, de they're shown now, sometimes make it look like an area is in a, in a deficit. Uh, Campus and Medical Center, those are two entities in the eyes of UCOP, and because Medical Center has their own standalone audited financials, they need to be able to disclose related party transactions, and so we are going to have to separately account for transactions between Campus and Medical Center, so that will be, that will be different for us. Uh, there's a set used for when UCOP uh, passes revenue to us, another set of accounts for when UCOP is passing expense to us, and then all of our internal recharge entries and cost allocations will start with 7-7 and they will need to net to zero. So that's one area where I think we need to explore uh, Oracle functionality, figure out the best way to handle our recharges for now in the chart of accounts. In addition to all the individual recharge debit accounts, um, we added a matching pair of recharge credit accounts. So lots of recharge accounts in our expense hierarchy, I think about 600. Um, so without knowing exactly how Oracle works yet, that would be um, a safe way to make sure that those are netting to zero. But hopefully there would be a, a better way to do that in Oracle without having to have all that detail in the ledger. Thank you. Yes. We got a question that actually relates to this. So someone's asking, once everyone goes on the common chart of accounts, will this make it quicker to process any location transfers if we're all using the same coding? Well, I think there will still be the, the issue of everyone, everyone being on a different system. 
and all the locations will have to map to these numbers when their ledger file goes to OP, that they will not necessarily need to use those internally in their own ledger. And I would, I would say not right away either because um, UCOP and UCSD are going to the common chart on July 1st, uh, 2020. However, I can, the only, one, only campus I can think of would be UCLA a year later. And I don't know of any plans or anything in the works at any other campuses to move to the common chart yet. So they'll probably be uh, remapping their legacy systems into the common chart hierarchies at UCOP to summarize their data. So if, if, that, if that does uh, streamline things, it probably won't be for a few years yet. I, just I think UCOP realizes that is a, a pain point for all the locations, yeah. being on different systems, different charts of accounts. Like, like locally, everyone can continue. We didn't have to change our chart of accounts, but if we didn't, we would have to map to a, a new structure and we wouldn't really have had all the input we did in the, the new structure. But maybe in our lifetime, because uh, I think UCOP wants to make our relationship with them so seamless because we're both on Oracle that all the other locations are jealous and maybe eventually they all see the benefit of being on the same system. A quick new, uh, pardon me, a quick note to the group. When the questions are posed from the Q&A, we can't quite hear you online. So uh, just speak up a little bit with the next question. Thank you. Oh, they couldn't hear the question. <coughs> um, the, the last one are uh, interlocation recharges. When, when we transact with another location, now we need to make sure and use a certain set of accounts. So all of our transactions, for example, with UCLA, will use one account, and that account will contain the net of those transactions. We have another question. This is the second time it's been asked. Uh, will this presentation be posted somewhere that we can access it afterwards? I think it is posted now. So uh, the presentation is already posted online. It's available at esr.ucsd.edu forward slash FIS under project communications. So this, this slide deck is already available and uh, hopefully by early next week we will post this recording as well. Same location. And in addition to that, I think Laura has posted all the chart of account hierarchies down to posting level. Yes, right. under chart of accounts. <laughs> <laughs> Same website. And, and I think those, uh, it's a file that shows the complete new Oracle hierarchy down to posting level in the mapped IFAS element. So you could see if, if your fund was this now, or is this now, it's going to be, you know, whatever it's going to be in Oracle. So. And, and both uh, myself and Marissa have moved closer to the middle of the room, so hopefully that should help with uh, asking the questions before they're answered. Okay. That's much better, Adam. Thank you. Okay, the, the next slide shows the uh, revenue account hierarchy, the highest level. Um, basically how our revenue is displayed on the audited consolidated financials. Next slide shows the expense hierarchy. Also how our expenses would display on the um, audited financials. There's not really the concept of sub-accounts in the hierarchy but there's definitely hierarchy levels. So I'm sure one decision that will need to be made is at what level do we budget? So right now we budget at the sub-account level. Uh, question would be, do we budget at this level A or B? But there's a team for that. There's a team working on that. All right, function structure. Uh, the function identifies the Nakubo higher ed purpose of an expense. It's going to be a three-digit code for us that will map to a two-digit code at UCOP. And our office is working on trying to identify for each IFAS org and program, what would the Oracle financial unit and function be? Because some of our, our program codes are not very descriptive. For example, they are titled something like core operations, and that um, doesn't tell us necessarily what what the Nakubo function of that area is so 
our office is almost done doing the initial mapping and we're going to be reaching out to some areas. Um, th this is what the hierarchy looks like, the structure. Um, so these are all the, the functions that a university with a teaching hospital would have and they're really important for our indirect cost rate proposal. So it is important that we are accurate with these. So we'll probably need to do an uh, education effort. We have a sheet that has the definition of each area. Um, so there, there are gonna be a number of academic departments, especially that will have a number of functions. You probably use a different program codes now and you might even have different board codes that go with those program codes, but you could have instruction, you could have research, you might have academic support and you might have financial aid that you're responsible for. So as you spend the money, you just need to be careful to use the right function code. This is really tiny, but it is the um, UC-wide program code when UCOP sends us money and they tell us, hey, this is Cal Teach money, you need to use this code. When you receive it from us and spend it, we will, we will do so. Project, Marissa. Me, all right. <laughs> so uh, as Jimmy said, project is going to actually be one of the chart elements. And so this is uh, gonna be used to track financial activity. Really uh, originally thinking about just sponsored projects and capital projects, but uh, we are also looking at you know, other kind of bodies of work, other financial activities that are being done in the departments that have uh, you know, start and end date, but it might span fiscal years. Um, really looking at just the, the wide variety of, of uses um, and business that is out there within the departments. Um, project looks like a really good fit for a lot of that business. Um, so all of the projects are going to be created and tracked through the Oracle PPM subledger. So PPM stands for the Project Portfolio Management. It is a subledger um, within within Oracle. It's really kind of a new concept, I'd say, for um, a lot of us in terms of this kind of activity being in the subledger. Right now, all of this activity is just in the general ledger. It's, it's all there. So uh, it's a little bit of a new concept for a lot of us that we'll get used to. Um, so all of the project spending will be going through PPM, not directly into the general ledger. Uh, so even though you'll see this project element as part of the chart, um, it, the, all the transactions are going to be coming through the subledger. So as we said, contracts and grants, um, really foreseeing service agreements going through here, capital projects, um, and probably a large variety of the department expenditure tracking. Like we see you know, effectively startups, uh, courses, events. Um, so we're really still kind of exploring all of that and understanding all of that and exactly what that's going to look like um, between the, the project as well as the activity, but um, that's that's what we're looking at right now. Do you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think you should go to the Oh, I would just add to that also that um, a, pro a project can be funded from multiple funds if necessary, which is a benefit that we don't have currently. Mm -hmm. um, Marissa, maybe you could talk a little bit about the, um, how you would actually post, because it's not using the chart string in the project subledger. Sure. So maybe the, the elements of how you actually the poet AF. Sure. So <laughs> in the subledger, um, the, there's different elements needed for, for costing, for doing the transactions in PPM. Uh, and it's commonly known as the poet string um, for for some of the business. And then you also have an additional A and an F. So POET and POET AF, uh, you'll need in, in PPM. So what does that stand for? POET is the uh, project, so the project number. O is the expenditure organization. E is the expenditure type. And T is the task. So as Jamie mentioned, we, there's projects and tasks. So that's where that task comes in. Then the A is award. So for sponsored projects or um, projects that, that that are, are sponsored. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's the A for award. And then uh, with those awards, it's the funding source, right? So that might be National Science Foundation or National Institutes of Health or um, Stanford University, whatever the case may be. So that's gonna be that funding type. So those will be the additional elements needed to transact 
um, through PPM. And so that is different from the, the basic chart of account um, that, that we've been seeing so far today. So. And so, and so um, there'll be a translation of activity in the project subledger through, um, I think it's uh, activity, SLAs, right? Yes, subledger. SLAs totally. will trans translate the activity in the subledger to the GL. So that's something the design teams are working on to make sure that maps properly into the GL. Yeah, so we have a lot of work to do to sort of understand all of, all of that, what that's going to look like. Um, we do have a couple of questions related that I'll take. So who will have access and ability to edit and create a project? And there, will there be hierarchies for projects? So um, the access and security is something that we are looking at as part of the design. We're looking at the rules available in Oracle. How are we going to design the uh, security, the rules, the workflows, uh, the access? So, um, so we're, we're looking at that. Um, so that, that will be coming, that's part of it. Most likely it'll be a little bit different depending upon the type of project that, that uh, we're talking about. And will there be hierarchies? So in Oracle, what you have, uh, if we think about sponsored projects, you have an award. Under that award, you can have one project, you could have two projects, you could have three projects, it, you can have many projects under that. And then each project has tasks. So it's not really a project hierarchy, it's really, it's a award project and task is really the, the structure. Uh, so I hope that answers that. And then this one might be good for uh, Bill. Bill. So someone asked, what is a subledger? What is a subledger? So without going too long, too much in detail, give a brief, uh, brief orientation. It's, a, on what it's a, subledger. a collection of accounting activity that would feed this, the general ledger. So we have lots of subledgers. We have, we'll have a PPM. We have accounts receivable, ISIS. accounts payable, ISIS. Um, those are all subledgers, so they would all feed the general ledger. It, yeah, it typically maintains the detail, and then the, the summary is posted to the ledger. Oracle does seem very subledger driven. Uh, the, the expenditure type that Marissa mentioned that will live in the project module, that can be a lot more detail. It's, it's an expenditure type table that maps to expense accounts in the chart of account general ledger. And I think our understanding is that that can be a lot more detailed um, and still allow people to report that information easily out of PPM and not have to have that level of detail in the expense accounts in the chart of accounts. Yeah, so all the costs will still be represented in the general ledger, um, but the level of detail uh, will be in the subledger, not in the general ledger like we're used to today. Let's see, we got another question. I was skimming really quick. It has to do with capital projects. Um, I think I'll, I'll capture the, co the, the capital project question at the end. We can come back so we can kind of uh, read that. And recharges. Yep, we can. So, so you briefly mentioned account codes and the recharges have the net zero. Could you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, being an internal, it's basically an internal cost allocation. Um, so we just need to be careful that those entries don't distort our external expense reporting. So if our PG&E, well, I guess we don't have PG&E down here, that's Northern California, SDGE bill for our electricity should be reported as our electricity cost. We shouldn't add to that an internal allocation. Uh, so that's, utilities. that seemed to answer that. <laughs> we've, we've hit a hot button. We've got a flurry of questions. <laughs> so the, yeah, so you don't want internal recharges distorting your expenses. Revenues. So we're, we are looking, we've talked to a university that does their recharge entries using PPM. And I think what they did is each recharge facility was identified by an expenditure type so that when the charges happened, you could see animal care or, or NGN as the kind of like the expense amount. Um, yet I think they all mapped those to one recharge debit in the ledger and one recharge credit. So certainly cases where using PPM could simplify entries in the ledger but still allow people to have access to the detail. 
Then one last one is an end date required to create a project. So there are dates in projects, but that depending upon the type of project, it might be a, a sponsored end date. It might be um, a fiscal year uh, end date, depending upon the type of activity. And going back to one of the other questions, I think one of the things that made us think a lot of the department detail might be able to be in the project module is that the ability to create a project could be distributed controlled and distributed whereas if we were to open up a chart element kind of like we we let departments create an index now once we create the master index if we were to open up a chart element and try to let departments create um, an activity code if you will there's nothing in Oracle that would stop them from creating or changing a fund code. So it's not really possible to distribute access to chart of account maintenance, but it seems like the project module or Oracle is set up to allow um, different departments to create projects. And I think there's a way to make sure that only OPAS can set up a contract and grant project. Um, only facilities management can create a capital project. And as far as a hierarchy, I think there's there's categories. There can be types of projects, right? There are With, project types, and you know we're still looking at the, the elements required for the security model. Right. Uh, location. So last year or a year and a half ago, when we were interviewing areas to see what kind of tracking they needed to do, it came up a couple times that some areas needed to track things by location such as William and the physician group. <laughs> uh, and perhaps location even being a ship, even though it's a moving location. So there is a chart element location. It's gonna be a six digit, starting with a letter. Uh, it will be based on primarily the CAN numbers for buildings. So it will just kind of, I guess, borrow off of that existing, um, those existing codes. It's optional. And it is optional, thank you, Bill. So this is just a little snip of what that would look like. I think we've since shortened them, haven't yeah, we though? Yeah, we have. Okay, knock, knock off a few <laughs> zeros and, and have it just be six and, and it's what it looks like. Sorry, Laura. Yeah. <laughs> My bad. Um, location, activity. Um, if any of you had been involved with previous discussions, for a minute there we thought, hey, activity might be what areas use for their departmental detail, but then we found out that there wouldn't be a good way to let departments create their own activity code because they would then be able to create any chart element. And shortly after that, we learned more about the project module functionality and got all excited. And so now it's looking like the departmental detail can be more in the project module and the activity would just be used where the project module is not appropriate, such as for balance sheet transactions, since PPM is, is meant for expenses. So for now, we are loading in some activity codes related to credit card merchant accounts identification, help identify the cash, cash inflows from those merchant accounts, and then for internal loan tracking. Hey, we got to the end. <laughs> Laura's fantastic website and all kinds of information is is here. We're it. I mean, what questions? And this this presentation is specifically on the um, Change Network yeah. tab or the Change Network uh, link on the left side of the that's website. Just one more questions and answers. Thank you. So we've received a couple more questions about recharge. Um, so we want to kind of bash them all together. Number one is, can you go over again the recharging net to zero, what that really means, what does that look like? And then um, will there be batch submissions of recharges on a monthly basis? Good question. So on one of those sites that Laura mentioned is the complete expense hierarchy, uh, where if you saw that, you would see probably 300 recharge debit accounts uh, mapped to uh, what I'm showing here, mapped to something that rolls up to 7-7, seven, seven, um, which is a level that UCOP cares about. And then you'd probably see 300 recharge credit accounts, so a pair. So if you're NGN, for example, 
um, you would have a recharge debit account that you would use and a recharge credit account and they better net to zero um, and they will both map to the same place on the shared hierarchy so when it goes to UCOP um, they will have already mapped and will have netted to zero that's how that will work Okay. We've had a couple questions that are not really chart of accounts related, but more system. Number one, address them as you need to or, or help set expectations. Number one, when will we get to see a sample of the ledger? And then number two, will the new system have any sort of NPET or EPET capability? And, and which element will that be based off of? So the first one, um, we, are, we are only starting design configuration in May. So that runs through uh, late summer, July, August. Um, after that, we have a lot of integration work to do and uh, adjustments to our design, obviously, to work through the integrations. So, um, and then a lot of testing, internal testing to make sure everything is working. Um, after that, I would think uh, user acceptance testing and training would probably begin next spring. So, there will be a select groups of uh, testers and users that will, will invite in to actually uh, help us um, exercise the system. But um, I think probably expectations around uh, next spring would be maybe the first time uh, most people on campus would see uh, the functionality in Oracle. And the other question was? Cost transfers. Cost transfers. You want to take that one? <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, so for the e ANPETs and EPETs type functionality, um, so far what I've seen in PPM, there there is an ability to adjust cost. So, you know, we know that we're going to have to move costs around. We can do that in Oracle. Much more than that, I have no idea. So <laughs> that is still to be determined, uh, still in training, and we'll design that. But uh, we will be able to... Uh, transfer costs. So, and then I also thought I would go ahead and address uh, another question here about uh, one project code being associated, more than one project code being associated with a transaction. I'm assuming that that's really thinking about when you purchase something, you need to charge it, you know, currently today to two different indexes. Um, that, that when you purchase things, I, as I understand it, yes, you should still be able to split that as you need to for um, that allocability to wherever that, that appropriate cost needs to be charged to. Um, and then someone asked if we have a, champ, a sample chart string they'd actually see. I looked at the slides. I don't see one, but we kind of have one in the bottom seven. In the next slide over. It doesn't actually have, but at the, the third of the bottom row, where it says planned UCSD field length, where it says five numeric, five alphanumeric, that will really be the chart string, except you'd obviously have to rep, you know, replace five numbers with the actual phrase five numeric. Or oh, an actual chart string, how is... Um, yeah, yeah, what it'll actually look like, the numbers. Yeah. But I don't, we don't actually have one in there. Uh, that the would be here. easy enough to, to yeah. throw some examples together. Yeah. What, what we also thought we would do is, um, for every, if we can identify the master indexes that show all of the valid combinations in IFAS, we should be able to map that to kind of the equivalent valid combination in Oracle. So we should be able to come up with some spreadsheet or table or view that says, if this is your, your IFAS um, index, this will be that equivalent valid combination in Oracle. Very close on that. We are? Yeah. Good job, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> what, what it wouldn't have, though, um, it, it will just have kind of the, the first, the fund, financial unit, and function mapped. Uh, we wouldn't really know what, what a project number might be or when it, where a location might be used or activity, but at least it'll give you a little visual. Another question here was, um, the, for contracts and grants, if there can be more than one project number. Um, yes, I anticipate that there will be um, oftentimes more than one project number for a particular sponsored project. Um, the award is what's going to kind of encompass that, and then there will be projects um, under that. Yeah, and you could have multiple funding sources for a project, right? So you could have a gift 
as well as a, an award, a federal award, state award, and uh, those would all be tied to the project. Are we allowed to ask questions? No. <laughs> Oh, we had a question for uh, for Laura. When will staff training start? Yeah, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how come there's no training yet? How come they can't get assistant today? I, I made up that last one. And you'll probably need to come over here. I was asking the that, same question that, that, Laura, before this. That mic doesn't work, so you'll um, come over here. Okay. So I think for what we know today, um, we're looking at a couple different solutions that are going to help with quick adoption. Um, and so what we're thinking is that after UAT, which is considered user acceptance testing, that's assuming that the system is designed, configured, we've gone through our, um, you know, our test strategy approach, we've made sure that there's no bugs, those are all out. So when we're close to a final product, product um, what we'll do is we'll have the user acceptance group and we're going to train them first on how to use the system. And we're anticipating that that will happen in late April of 2020, early May. And so uh, shortly thereafter, you know, shortly thereafter, we're hoping, uh, so, so there's two different things that you guys should know. So either we're going to try to get people pre-trained in a test environment, or we're going to have to make the decision to, you know, test uh, right before, you know, a couple weeks before go live um, with some, some what, what they call it is guided learning. So you'll actually have access to the real system um, or a test environment. So you can do your training in there a couple weeks before we go live July 1. Yeah, but we want, and another, another point is we want to make sure that um, the training is timed properly to when you actually will start using the system. So if we train you too early and then you leave for a few months, that learning tends to be lost. So we want to make it kind of a, a just in time training so that after you've taken the training, you're almost right into um, using it on a, a daily basis. So think about it. So May, June, and then beyond. Yeah. So go live and then a yeah, whole training will never stop. Training labs yeah. and deep dives and reporting, you know, all of that will happen after post go live. Yeah. Training will never stop in some ways, right? It shouldn't for no. our onboarding process. For onboarding, yeah. <laughs> you know, it should, it should continue. For It'll be continual training. So there's a question about location and location, will that feed from Trirega and it will, will it be building only? Yes. The building only except for the ships for now. That's been identified as the need. Yeah, we didn't want to go any lower than uh, building because then it gets very complex. And um, it, will, it will be fed from Trirega where there are CAN numbers where there are not CAN numbers and we, and we need a location for some of our medical clinics and we will uh, manually input uh, location data for those areas. All right, so two other questions for uh, Bill. One, well, yeah. Um, so number one, what historical data is gonna be imported over to Oracle? And I'll transfer that, we'll go to the next one. Okay, this is a big topic. So, um, <laughs> We are going to import as little historical data as we can. Um, it's the biggest risk to an implementation is the translation of legacy data into a new environment. You can see here from the chart of accounts, it's radically different from the legacy chart. So um, when you start to translate legacy data uh, into a new chart environment, that translation is gonna have issues. Um, not only for reporting, but for audit. So if you try to use um, historical data in the new system that has been translated into a new chart of accounts, um, you're putting yourself at audit risk. So we are we're going to make historical legacy data available to you so you'll always have access to it and we'll be able to join uh, old and new together but the caution is you want to be sure that there is that clean break um, between old and new so that when you are reporting to an agency or to an audit auditor that you are uh, informing them that, you know, this is in an old chart, this is in the new chart, but it will be classified properly in both areas. So, you know, we'll summarize as much as we can and move balances forward, um, but transactional um, legacy data, we're going to leave it and, uh, give you access to it. And part of the, the massive cleanup effort we did was to clean up 
chart elements in IFAS that weren't being used, uh, cleanup balances that were messy and inaccurate. So that we would not have to create Oracle elements for those things. So that when we started out with Oracle, it would be a more streamlined chart of accounts. So we got a couple questions on the, the launch date. So is the launch date still July 2020? And how does UC Path delay affect that? So the launch date is July 1, 2020. Um, UC Path is going live for us in May 2020 and for April, April payroll. So what we're going to have to do is um, we're going to design the UC path integration into Oracle, into this new chart of accounts. And we're going to feed back into IFAS for two months. Um, this sounds complicated and it is, um, but we'll be ready on July 1, 2020 with full UC path integration into Oracle. Uh, we just have to get through these first two months where we're um, remapping back in the legacy IFAS. Um, so I'm asking a couple questions to try to make it easier on you, but every oh, question you answer me? results in two more that come in. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. So, so the next two are um, related really to chart strength. So number one, how does somebody go to the bookstore right now and buy something? If they used to provide a seven character index and now they need a full chart string. And then related to that was, we've talked in the past about aliases and potentially having a shortcut there, if that's not an option or what else can be looked at to, to resolve that? Yeah, this is, um, this, is a, this is something that's been on our mind as well. Um, taking a full charge string to the bookstore to purchase something doesn't sound like a great idea to us either. Um, we're looking at different options. It may not be, it may not be a chart or a, an index, it may be some other way we approach the bookstore with a transaction. So we're still thinking through that. Might honestly. be an index card. <laughs> could, be, it could, be a <laughs> could be a physical thing, or it could be something we arrange with the bookstore, but it's more than one retailer. So we got to have a more common uh, approach. Um, yeah, that's something that's on our mind too. We recognize that as a big uh, issue, but index going away does take away that uh, quick transactional kind of uh, option at the bookstore. So we'll, we'll think of something. We're still working on it. And it, it turns out the alias, unlike the index, the alias has to have every single um, chart element filled out associated with it, including the account. Yeah, so alias doesn't work like an index does. It's, it's um, not the same functionality in Oracle. And, and I would be remiss, remiss in my uh, duties as Changely if I wasn't to say, it's important that we don't look at what we do today and say, I need to replicate everything the way I do it now it needs to be replicated in the new system. So just because you have an index number today used for something particular doesn't mean you have to do things in the exact same way. Things will be changing. We want to make sure we have as much functionality as possible today and hopefully even better functionality, but we will need to get used to doing things a little bit differently. We will try to accommodate the best as possible, but there will be changes. There will be shifts from the way that done in the past, the way it's going forward. And to, to build on that, if you have indexes that have zero balances that you're no longer using, please inactivate them. And um, if the fund, if it's the last index in a fund, please reach out to general accounting or foundation accounting, and we will close the inactivate those funds for you as well. And even small balances, I would add, if you can spend out small balances and close those out, that would be helpful, also. Um, excuse me, I'd like to add a quick reminder. I'm getting a couple of questions in the chat. And um, for folks uh, attending online, we're prioritizing the questions that go into the Q&A section. That way we can kind of get to everybody in a priority order. It's easier to manage. So there's two questions outstanding. If you could please transfer them to the Q&A section. And if not, I'll ultimately jump in. Uh, as we get through these and present your question. Thank you. And then either Lynn or, or Laura, so, so what's the plan for all of these questions that were asked today? Are they gonna be batched and submitted later on? Or will they see access to all the questions? Because some of these will be answering live and we don't have text for it. Yeah, so we're gonna post this webinar, it's recording, we're gonna post that and then we're also going to go through all of the questions. And what we're gonna do is try to identify themes and answer those questions and we'll post those online. Kind of like an FAQ. 
So just because I know Laura wasn't too close to the, uh, the working microphone, so in case you didn't hear that, this, the recording will be sent online so you can see it later. We'll also batch some of the questions. That means some of the questions we've been getting Q&A are very specific, so we can try to address some of those individually, but at some point we're not gonna be able to answer every single detailed question right now, so we'll try to answer the, the uh, large batch as much as possible. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so someone asked, um, how, how is this going to impact fiscal close both for this year and then also for 2020? Oh, that's a good question. Really good question. So for this year, um, status quo. Um, for June 30th, 2020, um, there'll be a transition of um, old data to new, obviously. Uh, we will keep legacy systems both for the medical center and campus open through uh, fiscal close, which is normally September, October. Um, so any adjustments to prior year data will be in legacy ISIS, but we will begin new activity on July 1st, 2020. So there will be a period of time where some folks are operating in two systems. Um, we need to make sure we close out the fiscal year properly before we move um, completely out of IFAS uh, and for audit. So um, that's the way that'll work. Okay, so we're just going through a couple more questions here. So um, we answered this one here. Uh, question about application and database developers on the ability to prepare for the change, getting access and, and whatnot. So we are going through um, uh, that downstream inventory that I'm sure many, most uh, of you participated in. Uh, we are uh, reviewing that downstream inventory and reaching out to all of you that did participate in that um, to understand that and to uh, understand those data needs and to talk to you about the future plans. So I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Um, no, integrations are... Uh being led by ITS, and they're prioritizing those integrations uh, for um, Go Live. They're also working directly with large groups, IT groups across campus, on the remediation plan in, in case there are, you know, are some systems that will stay um, or that we'll keep that will need to be integrated. They, they are working on that remediation plan with them. A couple more questions related to uh, projects for the PPM subledger. A uh, question about if there will be restrictions built in similar to rule classes. So there are uh, rules that we will design within the PPM subledger uh, to, um, you know, th there are rules. We can design those rules. We have not yet gotten there, but we will design various rules about um, a lot of things. Uh, so there is that functionality. Um, and then uh, capital projects uh, within the PPM module. Uh, what we know right now is that they will be in the, the PPM module. It is designed to really track costs. So we'll be able to set up uh, projects and there will be tasks under there. Um, and then it will, uh, it does also have functionality to tag and tie into the capitalization process in the fixed asset module. So that's about the level of detail Really have right now. Um, if you have more specific questions, uh, I mean, with, with all of you, feel free to throw another one in the Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, so we've received a couple questions about um, historical data and reporting. What's going to happen after crossover? If you have a report or project that goes, um, you know, 19, the 1920 year prior and 2021 year and beyond, how are you going to do cross year reporting? Carefully. Carefully. Okay, good. <laughs> part out of one place, part out of another. Carefully, yeah. It's going to have to be. Yeah. So it really is important that you are representing legacy data um, as it was classified in the accounting records um, for reporting. So um, joining that data may be possible at some summary levels, but I'd be very reluctant and I would not advise you to try to connect historical and, and uh, new data from an old and a new chart of accounts and represent them as continual sets of data. Um, it depends on your audience, of course. It depends on what you're uh, representing. 
But um, if you're in an agency review or an agency audit, or um, if you are subject to external audit from PwC, you really need to make sure those um, expenses are classified properly uh, in the old and new chart. Um, there will be access to that data. We'll, it'll be there for a long, long time, as long as you need it. Um, IT is working on how to really uh, retrieve the data in, in legacy. So those tools will be available. We'll provide training. Um, I guess that's about all I can, can't really say much more about it. They can learn more um, if they're interested. There's the financial analytics community of practice that is going into more about how they'll um, access that legacy data once it's moved over and what financial packages will be available for legacy yep. data. Um, so there's a community of practice, again, that's called the FAH, the Financial Activity uh, Hub Community of Practice, if they want to learn more. For contracts and grants, we're moving over, we're, we're thinking about how to move over um, data in a way that allows you to continually manage your awards um, with little distortion as possible. So instead of balances, we're looking at expenses, moving those forward. Um, that will give you, you know, the award balance in the new system and uh, cumulative expenses you'll start off with. So you'll have a remaining balance to be um, expended. That will make life a lot easier, but uh, the reporting will still be an old and new. The detail, the detailed the detail. transactions will be in. So we have a question here for the campus budget office for general accounting. What about Sophie? So is Sophie still gonna exist? Sophie How's lives. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sophie lives. So how's that going to work in terms of the chart of account and the fund hierarchy you showed? How does Sophie work? In that? It's in the um, unrestricted category. Um, I think I, I tried to make the numbers kind of consistent as possible, but yeah, it'll, the, the two of them will still exist. Polly will still maintain the overall mapping. Yeah. For reporting. <laughs> <laughs> A good one. Sophie, Sophie lives. lives. Sophie still lives. <laughs> <laughs> With a happy face? Or a happy said, Yippee, Sophie lives. <laughs> was that Holly? <laughs> uh, that was not. <laughs> not. Um, th there was one thing I, I kind of forgot to mention a difference between IFIS and Oracle is that um, in IFIS, a balance sheet balance only lives in a fund. In Oracle, it will need to live in an entity fund financial unit in account. So our office is going through an exercise now of trying to identify what department is responsible for what balance sheet account uh, using the records we have of who's supposed to be reconciling it. So based on email addresses and names, we're trying to figure out the uh, org that that person is getting paid out of and then from there identify the department. So we will be reaching out, um, but that will be important for when we load 630, 20, 20 balance sheet balances into Oracle, we will need to load them to entity fund financial unit. So position group, you will easily see all of your receivables in your financial unit. Financial unit of your choice, as long as it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> and next year as we're closing out IPAS, as we go through that transition period from June through September, balances will continually be changing, right? So those balances in the new system will have to be continually updated as adjustments are made in prior year data. And uh, we'll help you man we'll manage that for you. We'll help manage, make sure the balances uh, when we close out IFAs are the proper balances in uh, Oracle. But just to be aware those balances for those few months are going to be changing. Um, maybe not a lot, but they may be in a, they may be downward balances, they may be declining balances um, as adjustments are made. So just be aware that what you see on July 1 in Oracle is subject to change as far as beginning balances through uh, the end of IFAS. Speaking of balances, I think one thing that will have to be figured out is, you know, the right now a budget balance posts all the way down to the index level, which is about as detailed as you can get. So. There will have to be a decision made about, uh, and I, I don't want to spill the beans, but I can't resist. Um, I think we're going to move from <laughs> a budget balance focus to a fund balance focus, like real money. And so a decision, either way, it will need to be made 
how far down when we go from one year to another does a balance, whatever, whether we mean fund balance or budget balance. Of course, it'll go to entity, it'll go to fund. We're thinking it needs to go to financial unit. Um, it'll end up in probably a fund balance account, but then does it need to go to function? Does it need to go all the way down the, the food chain? So thought we'll need to be put into that. So, so we're getting a lot of questions right now. There are the, uh, the variety of yes, no questions. Will the new system do this? Will the new system do that? For the most part, the answers will be yes. You know, will the new system be able to uh, allocate finances or allocate a payroll to a particular person? Yes. yes. Will the new system have an integration with the credit cards? Yes. yes. How that's done is still to be determined. So a lot of these will there, we can respond back with yes. But I think the real question that people are trying to ask is, how is the new system going to integrate? How is it going to look like? And for most of those answers, we just don't know yet. So if we haven't responded to a specific question yet, it's maybe because we either, we don't have a specific answer to give it back quite at this point. So yeah, we'll, we, we kind of know how it's going to work, but we haven't actually designed it yet. So um, we don't want to get ahead of, ahead of our design um, teams. They have a lot of work to do in the coming months and a lot of process to work through but we kind of know how it's work, gonna work. Um, all the design teams have been through, let's see, at this point it's two or three months of Oracle University training, and this has been training that um, has taken hours and hours of, of work by the design teams. So they are a lot more familiar with how Oracle works today than they were um, earlier in the year. Um, but yeah, they're, they're at the point now where they're, they're ready to start configuring the system, but there's a lot of things we need to work through. So a question to one of your favorite topics, what will happen to agency accounts? Will they still exist? Yes. Agency, you love agency, accounts. agency funds. Agency funds, yeah. They'll still exist. Um, another favorite topic is control. So who will control new segments or, or new values of segments? What do departments have access to? What will be controlled centrally? And the chart of accounts? Yeah. Um, I think all of it, but project oh, might be yeah. able to be decentralized. Yeah, I don't, you know, the, um, one of, what, one of the, centralized. Centralized. What did I say? Decentralized. Decentralized. All of it. <laughs> so one of the issues we've had in our old chart is it has not had a lot of good governance through the years and it kind of morphed into something that um, really wasn't how it was intended to be. I don't think. Um, there's a lot of elements added that were convenient for um, departments that really kind of upset the integrity of how the chart was designed. And so we want to make sure that the functionality and the power of a chart of accounts isn't compromised by um, meddling too much in it. Creativity. Yeah, creativity. So um, <laughs> there will be a lot of governance around this new common chart of accounts. Keep in mind now that we are uh, three entities three entities in a single Oracle system. So any change to a chart element could affect the medical center, the campus, and the foundation together and uh, upset their reporting or their built-in processes. So we wanna make sure that any changes to the chart are considered carefully. We're still working around how that governance will work. Um, we have meetings next week with the medical center to. Uh, to explore some of that and we'll, we'll work through the foundation as well. But that, that's really a hot topic right now is uh, overall governance and how we maintain and sustain the entire system and don't compromise the uh, processes that we built in um, without some consideration of what the impacts might be. Uh, okay, we got a question for, uh, I'm trying to scroll through and get the chart of accounts questions. We're getting a lot of questions about system functionality, many of which, again, are either very detailed that we don't know the answer to. Uh, but there is a question about the financial unit. Um, is there going to be a hierarchy similar to like level two, level three that we have in org structure now? Absolutely. Uh, we have worked with the FOs of the different BC units to determine, uh, to take a look at the current hierarchy that is in ISIS and then to um, provide us a version that is simplified um, and captures any strategic changes that have happened you know, subsequently over the years. Sometimes IFIS doesn't reflect everything that's been done in reporting. 
uh, today. And so by working directly with your FOs, we have tried our best to uh, create a version that will more closely match what you're actually presenting to upper management. And so, yes, we will have a hierarchy. It is going to be um, working with the reporting that you're doing today, or at least a version of it. And it is going down to five levels, where the fifth level is the posting level. So I'm going to expand that just to have Diane jump in with something as well. Um, so are almost all the chart segments going to have some sort of hierarchy built into them? Yes. Sorry. Oh, you lose your chance. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Location barely had one. I think in Oracle you need something. So what did we call the parent? Did we end up calling it universe? Universe. Just for fun because yeah. we can call it what we want. Yeah. Yeah. So location, <laughs> the location only has one. Gotta put some fun in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, and this is again another system question. People are asking about what about um, integrations in our current system? So things like marketplace, my payments, my travel, other, what happens to those? They're still under evaluation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, the key ones like um, marketplace, it will be integrated. ISIS. ISIS will be integrated, pulled apart a little bit. Um, that's a very complex integration, probably our highest risk. Um, payables will be new. Travel is TBD right now, close, but TBD. And what else? What else, Adam? Uh, as soon as my payments, my travel, marketplace. No, oh, I don't know about my payments. I think that goes away. I think so. Yeah. Marketplace will probably, we're not sure yet. That's, t that's still TBD. Marketplace is still um, in discussion. Jagger. So uh, at, at one point we had um, over 450 people logged into the session, oh, nice. and I know some of those are groups as well. So we don't know how many individuals, but at least 450 logged into this. Scary. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they've been. Don't have any questions for long. Well, that's it. Yeah, we are. You know, we're available. Um, through the ESR website or wherever people contact us if they have questions. Um, not, not, all network, not all at once, not all at once. Through the Change Network, yep. Um, so, um, have, we want to be as transparent as we can. I have one question in the chat. It may have been answered, but it's um, ADEX is now used to charge ICR to grants. What will this look like in Oracle? Indirect costs will be processed through the PPM subledger. was one question in here about training time um, where someone was very concerned that two weeks was not enough time to like your system to conduct business yeah. so, sorry I just want to clarify it's not that you'll only have two weeks to train there will be a series of events that happen that lead up to go live um, but there's also you know the ideal state will that is that there will be in-system functionality that helps guide you like there has never been for a UCSD application before that would be the ideal state so but there will be trainings there will be training expos um, you may not have your hands on the system but we will be able to demo you know some processes so it's it's not gonna we're not gonna turn off IFIS and then you know on July 1 you're expected to know how to do it um, that's certainly not the case what we're trying to convey is that anywhere after user acceptance testing which ends april 2020 through july and beyond there's going to be a whole series of trainings specifically for end users specifically for train the trainers specifically for power users um, a whole series of trainings and, and that's all around reporting and all the different modules in oracle and yeah, keep in mind it's not like ifas where you need to know everything about um, oracle I mean, it, it's going to be a, an interface that is going to be tailored to your role. So, you know, you won't have to learn everything that the design teams are learning about how things work, but how they work for you. So they'll be specifically tailored to what you need to do in Oracle 
uh, under your role, um, which is entirely different than how IFAS really is today. So hopefully that's going to make it easier for you to learn yeah. and quicker to pick up on. And I think, I think users are going to really like it once they, once they see it work. I think a lot more virtual, a lot more deep dive sessions. The, the basic how-tos hopefully should be in the system for you guys. You know, it's not going to yeah. be like you have to go to all these UC, you know, in-person classes and you only have two weeks. It, it yeah. won't be that. You'll begin with a dashboard. I mean, you'll have a tailored dashboard just for you um, as a user. So you'll see blocks of um, infolets, we call them, um, that are specific to what your responsibilities are. And just a little bit further, sorry, just a little bit further down the line, uh, uh, once, we, once we're into design, we can also publish, you know, what is our reporting strategy? We'll have communications packages around all of those high priority uh, topics. So with, you know, the associated trainings that are available. So, you know, the BI strategy. So how are we going to do our reporting? <laughs> Uh, you know, the actual training plan and what end users can expect, all of that will be communicated. Um, and tons you know. of reading material if you want to get into it. Yep. Yep. It'll be as simple as an iPhone, right? It, it's, <laughs> a, it's a lot more intuitive than what we deal with today. It's, it's like tapping into an app on your phone. There was one um, concern you may have already addressed that had to do with the need to memorize chart strings to keep track of funds? Be so familiar with the chart of accounts though, and what there, fund you're charging. There is, a, there is an alias function where you can name a chart string with an alias, and instead of having to type in the whole chart string, we think this um, shortcut, this alias, you could call on, and it would populate the chart string. But the entire chart string. The entire chart string. And, but, and that's only available in GL. It's not available in the oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's. I think the, the basic answer is we're still figuring out yeah. what our options are. But it, it will be user based, right? So a short. We're thinking a short drop down list depending on the user. Yeah, that's true too. You won't see everything. All these chart elements. You will. I mean, you'll have something specific to your role. Um, so you won't have the ability to post for, let's say, another uh, functional unit necessarily, unless you've been granted access to do that. So some of it should be very simple. Other, other parts may not be quite as simple. Yeah, and also, depending on the transactions that you're doing, um, there's imports via Excel templates. So you could have an Excel template filled out with the chart elements that you don't need to change um, or that you only have to change a little bit. And then you can do an import, depending on which which piece of the system you're working with. These things have all come up in our discussions. We recognize that they're um, user kind of uh, issues, index, chart string length, <coughs> um, the ability to properly classify a transaction. Previously, we've used index, and it's kind of been like the band aid for everything. And uh, recognize that's going away. So we do need some training. Uh, we do need to support. I think we can take this one. This one's for you, Kirsten. Okay. Um, with foundation being integrated now with the chart of accounts, can users directly transfer gift fund balances across entities? So we are still exploring how that could be streamlined. Um, the foundation will be on a separate. Um, data set from the campus. So it's not as simple as doing one single journal entry. It still requires two journal entries. We have to make sure there's proper controls around it, but we are trying to find a solution to make it easier and to potentially not have to submit paper requests for transfer. Um, okay. Also, while we are adopting the common chart hierarchy structure, our account values will be different. Um, so there will be some slight differences between foundation and campus for that piece, but the fund number and department numbers or financial unit numbers will be the same. Oh, and I should also add, we're also exploring reporting opportunities uh, to be able to visualize both foundation and uh, campus fund balances together by department. Is that it? Gone dead? Yeah. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks everyone for um, attending. I mean, the chart of account gurus out there that really love this stuff, we do too. Um, we've been immersed in this for, well, Jamie's been really immersed in this for a year and a half. Um, much bigger than we ever thought it would be, but we're in a great place to uh, start design. So <laughs> bigger than I thought it would be, that's for sure. But um, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for attending. If you have follow-up questions, just um, let us know, and we'll try to get them answered as best we can, maybe in the FAQs. And, and also the, the format. If you like the format, this is a good way for us to get to a broad audience. Um, so hopefully we'll do things like this again in the future. Thanks, everyone. Woo